So I'm going to do something a little bit different to some of everything else here and um, take a little bit of a look at, at the softer side of developer productivity, right? So at the end of the day, this is why we're here, right? Why, why do we want developer productivity? Because we want these happy, smiling devs to actually get stuff done for us. Now, obviously metrics and all these things help us understand whether they're smiling or not, hopefully. But we also heard that's pretty hard, right? So, um, but there's a bunch of research and psychological research that, that kind of looks at team engagement. So again, if we've got great tooling and a great experience and guardrails and all these kinds of things, that's awesome. But you're still not getting that last mile of productivity out of your dev teams, right? So what I want to try and do is we'll, we'll uh, go through Google's five dimensions of team engagement and look at how some of the practices um, link to um, those dimensions, right? Um, the idea behind where I'm coming from with it is to um, try and show you if you look at the, the dimensions and figure out where your team is against those dimensions, you can start figuring out which practices you maybe want to start applying or doubling down on to stabilize that level and then move on to the next level of engagement. So Google pretty much didn't, I don't think they intended to present them as hierarchical, but they do kind of build on each other. So first level is psychological safety. So as you can see there, uh, teams with high rates, of, high rates of psychological safety have a 6% increase in being ahead of schedule, a 10% increase in meeting their targets, and a 20% decrease in turnover. And obviously those are, doesn't sound like that much, but that's a big thing, the 20% piece, especially with the knowledge war and like how uh, bespoke everybody's environment. So the, the, the more you can hold on to your staff, the better, right? It makes things go a lot faster. Um, so the idea behind psychological safety is obviously that people are willing to take interpersonal risks within your team. So what are those, like the practices that enable those kinds of things? So obviously you've got retrospectives where we ask those questions. Hey, what could we do better? What did you like? What didn't you do? Anybody done mad, get mad, glad, and sad type retros? There's a whole bunch of those kinds of things that help starting to build that safety and um, uh, candor within the team. Now, again, that's really, really important from a um, productivity perspective because without that candor, they're not going to tell you where your problems are. So you've really got to work hard to um, kind of push, push that uh, safety angle within your teams. Now, I'm actually really excited about a lot of the generative AI talks that we've heard today because as you start looking at them, they can apply to a lot of these dimensions as well. So uh, the code review practices that generative AI supply, um, that's actually kind of cool because now I can actually make my code a little bit better before I show it to anybody else. So that's helpful. Uh, things like linters and um, uh, blameless postmortems and all these other things, again, go a long way to giving you the confidence to maybe be a little bit more risky with your teams and expose your exposure things. But obviously from a management perspective and from a peer-to-peer -peer perspective, we've also got to create that safe space so people will be candid with each other. Um, automated test suites and all those kinds of things as well, that goes to psychological safety. If you've got a good, reliable test suite, well, you're going to ship code more often because you've got that safety that hopefully the tests are going to catch any stupid mistakes you make before they get into a position where they're going to embarrass you right? Um, and that kind of is a big kind of cornerstone to productivity is having that safe space to, to get things going. Um, and we really have to be very careful of using telemetry and all these metrics to compare teams to each other, right? Because that can very quickly erode uh, psychological safety. Um, you know, we've all had weaponized metrics and all these kinds of things. Um, I can't remember who said it, but there was a quote that as soon as a, met a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure because people are going to gain it, right? So that's why we, we've got to think about that. So we'll move on to the next one. This is structure and clarity. So just 50% of workers indicate that they know what is expected of them. And that leads to low engagement. If you rock up and you don't know what you need to do on that day and you don't have a plan for that day, you are not going to be as productive because it's going to take time to figure out what you need to do. You're going to have to maybe speak to your mates. You're going to be potentially a bit disruptive because hey, nobody wants to necessarily do work that they don't have a plan, right? So that's where having opinionation in our build tooling and uh, guardrails and all these kinds of things, that creates that structure and clarity, right? And we can actually tie that back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Structure and clarity helps create a sense of belonging 
And that is a foundational piece for higher achievement and creativity. So things like coding standards, an opinionated bill pipeline, you know, great. If you need, if you need the, uh, the escape hatch, like we heard, you know, folks talking about this morning, that's great. But at least that's a conscious decision that you need to make. But having all those other things and reducing that cognitive load um, creates the structure and clarity. You have sprints and maybe your Kanban or, or Lean. All of that helps people understand where they are in the process. And that allows you to get more out of them because they know what they need to do next and they can start working towards it, figure out what they're, what they're doing. Now, there's a lot of other things that we can look, like, uh, look at that create that structure and clarity. Um, again, uh, the generative AI stuff and the ability to kind of structure things in a, a very good way compared to like all, your, all the other groups that are out there, uh, and that, that kind of collective knowledge and the ability to bring knowledge from lots of different things together helps create that structure and clarity that you need to solve the problem because you can experiment a lot more, a lot faster. Move on to the next one, which is dependability. Obviously, developer productivity, we heard a lot about fast feedback cycles um, and reliable tooling, flaky, you know, eliminating or, or getting rid of flaky tests. Um, there's also a human aspect of that um, in terms of uh, can you depend on your peers? So, you know, you, that's why pair programming is incredibly powerful because it starts creating that connection and you're kind of getting a in situ code review at the same time, which is also a bonus, but it also shares that knowledge. And by pair programming, you know that you could depend on that person next to you because they're going to help you catch your mistakes. That trust goes a long way to um, um, finding productivity. The other side of it is looking up and management. Um, if you know managements are going to uh, kind of help maintain, the, for example, the firmness of the sprint and not let stuff creep in and not let scope creep erode things, again, that means you've got a dependable process, right? You know what you need to do and you're able to get through it a lot faster. Um, we have to like make sure that we're paying down technical debt because again, that becomes inertial and it drags you down eventually. Um, and that's again, you know, generative AI and all these kinds of things will make that a little bit easier for everybody. It's not going to solve, it's not a silver bullet, but if you're doing these things, you make your system more dependable. Unit testing and having a, a large variety of tests help you ensure you've got that dependability in your system. Now, as we get onto the next two, um, you can see they kind of all layer onto each other. You need to have a psychological safe space to be candid with each other and kind of get all the problems that you might have with your existing processes out in the open. You then work with each other to create that structure and clarity about how you're going to move forward and, and work. And then you start working to ensure that that process is reliable and dependable as much as possible. And that will accelerate you massively because people come in and know what they need to, they, they can be honest with each other. They know what they need to do. And they know that the tools that they have are sharp enough to get the job done. Now, if we then look at the, uh, the dimension of impact, that's actually kind of outward looking. That motivation of why am I getting up in the morning? Why am I working? Why, you know, we're all here to make engineers' lives better, right? Um, with all the metrics and things that we have, those go a long way to um, helping us tell the story of what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And as managers, we need to make sure that we are constantly communicating that to the engineers in our team and helping them understand their impact, right? Now, it sounds silly. Uh, JP Morgan launched a, a product called Uinvest. One of the things I love about this is it was born out of trying to make sure people um, saved money for their futures. So if you're part of that in you invest team, they have huge numbers of clients now that have saved for the first time in their entire life. Doesn't that feel good that you're working on something like that? I mean, it's JP Morgan's huge, but we are having a social impact. The developers in that team can see that impact and they telegraph that regularly. And we try and do that throughout our groups where we can. And that leads to massive amounts of engagement because people understand what they're doing. And then you've got all the other frameworks and other structures and things like that that allow them to hone their craft. And we'll come on to that in a second. But the key thing there is impact is incredibly important to understand how you're affecting the outer world. How are you impacting the business? And that drives huge amounts of engagement um, within your developers. But you, you have to help them understand the story. Um, and you need metrics and telemetry and all of that data. So service level obje objectives and SLIs, you know, if those accurately represent what you're what's happening to your customer, and you've got that tight feedback loop, 
it's amazing because developers can say, hey, I shipped that code and now that's four times faster or I'm supporting 10 times more customers or things like that. That sense of achievement spurs them on to doing more things, uh, to, to doing better things. Yeah. Um, final piece is meaning. Um, and this is a slightly more personal view of things. Um, maybe you're, someone in your team became experts in a new technology, right? They were, the tra they were trailblazing, right? Um, or mastered a new optimization technique, or, or maybe they just cleaned up a lot of technical debt and builds are a lot faster, right? Um, and they used all of that. So there's this thing called the Pygmalion effect um, that shows higher expect expectations lead to increased for increases in performance, right? So again, by having that whole safe space and structure and dependability and helping them understand what they're actually doing for the business, you have um, an amazing opportunity to help them understand how the engineer is growing. And again, if people are coming in every day and they feel like they're learning and they feel like they're growing, right, they're going to be motivated to come in and give the best that they can. Um, and that's why in this dimension, we really have to, um, we don't, try again, don't want to underestimate the power of recognition, right? Um, whether it's peer to peer or top down, it's something that you really need to inculcate in your, in, in your culture. Um, and it needs to be specific and as close to the event as possible. Um, we've all had that great job three weeks later. It doesn't quite mean the same. But if you're very specific, it's like, hey, that, that feature that you delivered is the bomb. It was really, really good. As soon as it went live, it's like we've, we've seen a tenfold increase in our conversion rate. That's really specific. It's timely. You're going to feel good. You're going to go home. You're going to tell your wife, husband about all these things. Um, peer to peer recognition is really, really great as well. So, you know, the ability to uh, know that your peers respect you is often much, a much stronger motivation than top down recognition. Top down recognition is important, but knowing that you have the respect of your peers is a massive uh, driver to team engagement. So, you really have to understand the dynamics of your team um, and, and how to nurture them. And you're going to work through these five levels and you need to constantly tie all of these metrics back to the levels so that you can understand what you need to double down on. So if you've got a team that's missing their deadlines, they're not telling you what's wrong, they're all hunched over, you know, not talking to each other and things like that, you've got a problem with psychological safety. So start focusing on how to get them to open up, get everything out on the table, make it safe, and then act on the things that they're telling you is a problem. Small changes there, continuous. Anybody read Atomic Habits? Really, really great book. A 1% improvement every day means you will be 37 times better at the end of the year, right? So that small, small changes in this can significantly improve things like psychological safety. Once you've kind of stabilized the team and that kind of stuff, you can start working on to really laying down the structure that people need. And then you can move on to making the tooling more dependable. If that is a problem, it might not be. You could have a really reliable system. Again, looking at what the what the problems are really helps people understand um, how you need to focus and how to leverage these metrics. So I was really in, uh, really happy to see when Grant presented the you know goal signal and measures kind of conversation because it does type into this kind of thing uh, really really well. Um, if you look at it through a little bit more of a human lens, especially when you're setting your goals you'll also find you're able to drive your engagement much, much better um, by doing that. I'm going to be pretty short on this and then maybe open it up for, for, for a bit of a conversation with, with, with you guys. Um, if you really want to drive engagement, um, don't play the comparison game. Like everybody wants to be like Netflix and Google and all those kinds of things. But the reality of it is you're probably not, unless of course you're all those people, right? <laughs> but, um, but the best thing you can do there is really use the feedback cycles and the feedback loops that you have. Look at it through the lens of psychological safety and dependability and, the, and these dimensions and engage with your team on a more personal level. At the end of the day, engineers are instances of humans, right? If you look at it that way. So that's pretty much all I've got. I'd, I just wanted to have a bit more of a conversation with you guys and take a slightly different turn through this process. Um, any questions?